Um, everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, uh, it's great to be here. I uh, feel I should start with a, a warning. Um, I, I really hate when people talk and it turns out they have an agenda that they didn't disclose up front. So <laughs> I want to disclose my agenda up front. Uh, uh, for the last several years, I've been researching, exploring, and advocating for a much qualitatively greater degree of robustness in the computer systems we use in the world, in, this, in society today. I think the way that we're building computers is beyond crazy. And I think there's a better way to do it, and the better way to do it is the sort of robustness that uh, SFI knows a lot about. And so I try to maintain a neutral point of view as I give these talks, uh, but I sometimes inevitably slip into excessive partisanship. Uh, and since I am going to be saying some tough things about some of the things that we use quite frequently in science and engineering, uh, I urge you to call me out if I, if I step too far, uh, uh, and it will help me improve the pitch. So uh, with that said, uh, I believe every talk should begin with the creation of the universe and work its way forwards. Uh, uh, so today, the beginning of the universe is the purpose of science or the purposes of science. And in particular, I want to make a distinction between science in service of no knowledge of what exists and service in service, science in service of building what does not exist. Science in service of understanding uh, what's out there and science in service of engineering new things. And we'd like to think that those are two tracks that travel in parallel, that if you learn more about what is out there, you can use that in some way uh, to engineer stuff that is like what's out there or modification on what's out there and so forth. And many times you can. And most of the history of science, I feel that scientists are typically thinking, I'm trying to explain what's out there. That's my purpose. And then somebody else, engineer, uh, uh, if they come along and take my theory and try to build something with it, well, that's on them. Uh, uh, my job is done when I explain some piece of data, uh, or predicted a piece of data, something like that. However, when it comes to computing devices, in particular when it comes to computer architecture, the way that we frame our models, even if we just did it for scientific understanding of what's out there, can make a huge difference in the kinds of devices that we are then able to build from that model. And when we're building models to explain stuff out in the world, we can do anything we want. We can assume there's periodic boundary conditions. We can assume the whole thing is synchronously clocked. We can assume it's perfectly reliable. Whatever works, because whatever model we make is justified by the fact that it does explain the data. It does make a prediction. And then we're done. But a lot of those assumptions, and these are the four, the hard way of the title, these four assumptions that are very frequently made that come around and bite us when we use them not for science, but for engineering as the basis of computing models. So that's the aggressive take that I want to do. And my claim is, is that the assumptions that we've used to build computing machinery are great to get started and are running out of gas. Uh, computer systems are no longer growing like they used to be, not getting faster, not getting bigger and they're completely unsecurable, <coughs> so much so that we are absolutely living in crazy land by thinking we're going to deploy this kind of technology on more and more and more responsibility, it's stuff that has more and more kinetic power behind it. And I was l reminded, you, you may have seen this uh, uh, from John Oliver on Sunday, uh, where <coughs> he's making a point uh, that, you know, we got the whole Apple versus FBI thing that is supposedly about encryption and ultra-strong, unbreakable encryption. And, and, and John Oliver, because he's great, uh, uh, at the end of it, he's making the point that really it, Apple would be more honest if they admitted that the encryption argument is basically about putting a medical lock on a door made of Kleenex. 
uh-uh, because the entire model, the entire architectural model is so fundamentally unsecurable that if you can't go in through the encryption, who cares? There'll be a bug here, there'll be a bug there, there'll be a bug otherwise, you just drive right around it. And so this was the payoff at the end, uh, the, after we saw all the Apple engineers working feverishly trying to catch up with the bad guy hackers who were getting in, where we are is don't worry about that, keep dancing madly on the lip of the volcano as we're about to fall into this unbelievable security disaster. And that's indeed what I believe is the case. <laughs> um, all right. So, yes, jump in. <laughs> and, and what did they say? Yeah, it's, it, well, it dep I mean, it's total disaster, snicker, snicker, uh, uh, like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, you should definitely have good encryption. Uh, don't, you know, look at this hand, uh, like that. And, and, and I'd like to give some suggestions as to why it is a disaster, number one, and that there is an alternative. There is actually an alternative. It wouldn't matter if we were in crazy, stupid land if there was no other choice. Uh, but there is another choice, it's just we know almost nothing about it. And the reason we know almost nothing about it is it's almost a duel to the approach we're doing now. It's insufficient to change one assumption. You change one assumption, it looks strictly worse than doing what we're doing now. You change two assumptions, it probably still looks strictly worse than what we're doing now. You have to change a whole bunch of assumptions all at once and people are naturally reluctant to do that. Uh, um, okay, here are the four assumptions I want to talk about. Uh, determinism, centralization, closed boundaries, and synchronization. Those are all hallmarks of the way we do digital computation uh, today, and they're hallmarks of many theoretical and mathematical models that we use for all kinds of useful purposes when we're using them for science, when we're using them for predicting, uh, for explaining and predicting what's out there. But then when we turn around and use them as a basis for designing machinery, that's where we go wrong. So <coughs> the alternative I'm going to suggest is best effort computing. And the idea is the number one thing that we know about computers theoretically is that if you wait for them to finish, they'll give you the right answer. Uh, and if they can't give you the right answer because something's gone wrong, they will crash. That's what determinism means. Same input, same output, guaranteed or a crash. Those are the only two outcomes, okay? And that's the way computers have been designed since von Neumann, since before. And the beauty of this is that it get, lets you completely ignore physics, lets you completely ignore reality and just live in the land of logic, just live in the land of modus ponens. And it's so happy and we're good at that, relatively speaking. Absolutely, absolutely, yes, yes, this is what we call separation of concerns, uh, um, and we think th this is a brilliant, smart, economic move. Uh, and it is, up to a point, uh, until it isn't. Uh, and uh, the suggestion is we're getting to the point, or from some points, in scalability, we're getting to the point where it's not such a smart move. And from security, forget it, uh, we passed the point that it was a smart move in the 60s. Uh, uh, long before anything like the internet was a gleam in anybody's eye. Go. I, yep. That's not true, actually. Uh, um, I mean, that, that, it's, it's a, because there are these things called lasers and heat guns uh, that we attack the hardware. Even if the program is absolutely perfect, we'll just come in and selectively flip some bits. Well, let me say this. Uh, I agree with you up to a point, but fundamentally, the division of labor between hardware and software is broken. 
So just to say the problem is on one side or the other is missing the fact that the contract needs to be renegotiated on both sides, okay? Uh, uh, you're accepting that the way hardware works is okay, and I want to try to convince... Oh, the problem we... Well, <laughs> let, let, me, let me go on and see if I can convince you that the way these assumptions interact means software has to come out essentially as crappy as it is. That, that to think that that's just a matter of lazy programmers or bad managers or something like that is really missing the bigger point. That it's impossible to write software that doesn't suck in the sense that you're thinking of. Okay, so I want to go through each of these uh, things. Okay, I got a clock right there. When did I start? We don't know. All right, 12.15, so I'm going to end at 1-ish, something like that. All right, it could happen. Uh, um, <laughs> That's why I put the conclusions at the beginning. Uh, um, and All right. Uh, um, so there's an easy way and a hard way. Uh, uh, the idea is to counterpose them. Uh, so the easy way is this idea of determinism. And the, the basic pitch is we're going to divide the world between hardware and software. The job of hardware is to turn physics into logic. The job of software is to turn logic into money. And you have to do both. You have to get all the way to the end, and there has to be enough money to pay for the hardware and the software. Uh, uh, and that's the deal. And it's worked great. And the way the deal worked is by, soft, by hardware providing guaranteed reliability. That's what hardware determinism means. Hardware guarantees to either give you the same output for the same input or crash. And if, if it does neither of those, then hardware has violated the contract. But if it does give the same input for the same output or crash and anything else goes wrong, software has violated its side of the contract. Okay, that's the way the, the, the negotiation worked and it's been great. One thing at a time, step by step by step, serial determinism is how all programs, all computers work since von Neumann through to today. Okay? And a bunch of people that were involved in it. Now, there are problems with determinism, and people have complained about it, not least of which was von Neumann. And von Neumann said, you know, oh, you know, it, you have to kind of read between the lines, but really von Neumann basically said, you know, I made this von Neumann machine with the hardware de determinism, not because it was such a great idea, but because I was sure it would work. I was sure we could make it work. And in the future, he thought in the near future, we're going to get rid of hardware determinism. And we're going to realize that operations will have to be allowed to fail with low but non-zero probabilities. In other words, the software was going to have to recognize the fact that errors might get delivered by the hardware without crashing the machine. Okay? Uh, uh, and he thought this would happen by the time we got to 10,000 gates, 10,000 switching organisms. Ha! The thing that, that you know, I, I drank the deterministic Kool-Aid uh, for a good 40 years, 50 years uh, uh, a long time. Uh, um, and it took me a, a tremendous amount of unlearning, which is why, of course, I end up being sort of a, you know, strident uh, uh, about it now. Uh, nothing like the reformer. We think about the mission of computing, writing programs and algorithms to be efficient that that's what it's all about. But at the hardware level, it's unbelievably redundant. When analog computers were around, back in von Neumann's early time, you could get a useful result from a machine with seven amplifiers. Every gate is an amplifier. Uh, but you could not do error correction. So now we say, let's take an entire wire that could easily hold two and a half significant digits and hold one bit. Incredibly redundant. Let's put an amplifier every time the wire takes a turn to regenerate the bit before it's got hardly any chance at all of actually getting far enough to flip. Digital hardware buys its reliability by an incredible act of redundancy. And then we forget that. We get to the logic layer and we say it's all about efficiency. It's all about eliminating redundancy. And that, I argue, is in fact 
part and parcel of the problem and part of the fundamental reason why the hardware software boundary has to be renegotiated. Go for it. Yes, please. You have to pay for it, though. So, uh, but whereas the software is interfacing with my brain, and that's what it is. Increasingly, it's interfacing with the engine in your car. Well, okay, there's that. Yeah. No, that okay, that's interesting. But my view is that I want my language and software to be efficient because I want to grasp it, and so there are done with my view. Hmm. Not necessarily. Uh, I mean, it's much easier from some points of view to understand a linear system than it is to understand a logical system where it can slice the uh, problem space up into arbitrarily tiny little hypercubes and do completely different things here versus here. And it'd be much easier if you had a system that was 90% linear that just had a few little twists and places that you could get to know. So I think we've become brainwashed by logic and it's taken us away from thinking about statistical inference rather than logical inference. And intuitions could change, I think. Chris. I think it's helpful in this kind of debate to realize that software is really just a convenient way to set the states of hardware. Think about software as substituting for the logistic capacitors and soldering iron, which is using to set the states of the machine. And think about it I, I, I agree with that with two footnotes. Uh, footnote number one is that using software to set these capacitors and transistors and wires is in fact much softer than using a wire and a piece of solder in terms of the odds of that thing going wrong. And that matters. And number two, using software allows you to do this virtual soldering after the device has been sold. And that's key. Uh, uh, so you make the same device once, and you sell it to everybody, and you can amortize a $7 billion chip factory and sell the chips at a buck each because you're going to sell hundreds and hundreds of billions of them, whatever it is like that. And you can't do that if you're thinking of it in terms of virtual hardware. We need to recognize there's a spectrum from hardness to softness. And we, in fact, want to get more gradations in there. Living systems have all sorts of degrees of a little bit of plasticity here and a little bit of homeostasis there and so forth. This Boolean, it's either completely hard or totally soft, is part of the problem. Okay, so this is the big one. If we are going to reject determinism, that means our computer may say one plus one is three, and our software is supposed to deal with that. Or worse, we say if x is equal to 0 and x is equal to 0, but it just decides to go the other way anyway. What's your program going to do with that? How can we even imagine programming that could do anything reasonable with that? So the suggestion is, if we give up on hardware determinism, the replacement is best effort computing. Best effort comes from the land of networking, telephony, where best effort networks do not actually promise to deliver your bits. The classic example is the postal system. The postal system makes no guarantees how long it will take your letter to get from A to B because it didn't know whether you were going to send one or not. It didn't save room on the truck for it, and it might just have to wait for the next truck. The Postal Service delivers your mail under best effort conditions. I'm suggesting we have to take that notion of best effort and bring it inside the computer in the interface between hardware and software. Um, I'm trying to determine how radical the suggestion is. Um, it, yeah, right. <laughs> is it, are you also, I mean, you could imagine, there are certain like mission critical applications like medical devices. Absolutely. Like the space shuttle. Absolutely. Are you suggesting that even in those you move to a best effort? Or that Especially those in those. Uh, uh, really yes. <laughs> uh, 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 the, idea, the idea is going to be that we, we currently pretend 
that you can't even talk about an algorithm at all unless it's correct, unless it actually does what it's supposed to do. And if the program is incorrect, talking about whether it's efficient or not is completely stupid, right? Uh, um, so the problem <laughs> is, is that today, all of the pro software in this room, essentially, you can't say whether it's correct or not because there's no spec, there's no specification, there's no formal do document that says this is a legal Google search and this isn't. And the fact that, you know, between the time you started typing the query and the time you hit enter, 7,000 new pages were added to the web. You should be able to find them, right? No, because there's no spec for correctness. So we're living in this emperor's new clothes land where we pretend that algorithms must be correct to even talk about them, and it's really not even possible for them to be correct. The suggestion is, when we move to best effort computing, is that we are gonna, try, we are gonna be survive. We are gonna be close. We're gonna give some kind of answer. And for things that are mission critical, we are going to overstock the hardware by a redundancy factor of 30 or 70 or whatever it is. So the chance of it getting a significantly wrong answer is as small as you like. But we're not going to guarantee it. Because we can't. That's the idea. Yeah. R r right, this is what I'm saying. I mean, in, in, in computer science, the idea of correctness basically means you have a program, and then you have another description of what the program is supposed to do, written in logic or mathematics, typically. And proving a program correct is showing an equivalence between this actual program and this theoretical description of a program. And if you can show that, then you have proven the program correct. So in that case, it would be well-defined. If we agree that this is the spec, the problem is these specs don't exist. So you're right. A, a program is just not necessarily correct or not, it, unless you have the spec that you can make this alignments to. Well, and, and this is the right, the real problem that program verification was something that was really hot in the 70s and 80s and they got up to 20 or 50 line programs and it was really, really, really hard to go beyond that because the intractability of the thing is so far beyond mere polynomial problems or even exponential and so forth. So, here's my proposal for the new contract. This shall govern all hardware and software in the future. Hardware shall make its best effort to operate properly, but it doesn't guarantee to do so. And even the f way that it fails is uncertain. It's not that it promises to have Poisson errors or IID or no more than two-bit errors or anything like that. The way it fails is unknown. You cannot box it and factor it out. It's always there. Have a nice day. This is why you get it. This is the hard way. And the idea is if we take these tough decisions up front, if we are good enough, we could make software anyway. If we're good enough, we could actually make stuff that'll compute on top of garbage hardware like this. We just don't admit it. Yes. Uh, um, and that's important because, again, the purpose of an interface is to assign blame, right? And so if the current interface says hardware guarantees reliability, that means if it's not, it's hardware's fault. So there's no pressure on software at all to sweep up after hardware. Are you suggesting that this be set up in a way that you know something about the structure of errors? Or that, they may, they, they, that they may occur. Nope. It's okay. unknown. <laughs> it's unknown. And you go, <laughs> okay, so then I might as well just shoot myself, right? Because there's nothing I can do. That's yeah, a quote Churchill all of a sudden. Sometimes your best is not good enough, right? You just have to do it. And that's <laughs> the point. Because the flip side of it is that software becomes best effort as well. Software no longer has to pretend it will guarantee correctness either. And so if despite all our best efforts to cover these weird error patterns and these long tails and these black, blue, green swans, whatever it is, if the hardware still screws us harder than we're expecting, we get to die. And it's okay. Why are the error patterns so hard to, uh, to 
to keep the software guys from just applying the surgical minimum amount of redundancy to hide whatever we admit the error distribution is and then go back to their jolly determinism like that. Well, I'm not sure if that's even technically true if you consider, for example, a shotgun or a taser to be a physical process. Uh, uh, that could happen to hardware. Right. We can, we can make pretty much any kind of error we want uh, uh, once we get malice in there. Was there another comment? the mapping from input to output might not be the same twice. It's going to come from some properties of the physical system itself. We're going to try. I'm sorry? The, the word have to have, I'm not sure about. You want to have, absolutely. No, it doesn't have a meaning. I mean, I don't really know what additional, you know, processes and information. Well, I mean, the point of it is, is that hardware can fail. That's just reality, right? And so it may be the case that between input and output, one and one does produce three. And that may cause the answer to be off by a tenth of a percent or by a billion. This is just admitting that. So you ask, where does the extra information from? You could say it comes from noise, but it comes in. And what we're doing here is we're loading up software's job to admit that. And maybe if software's got an extra microsecond, it could run the thing again just to see if the answer comes out the same. You know, is it still one and one and three? How hard is that? It's not hard at all if we have our architecture set up to, number one, make it software's fault if it doesn't check its work. Don't we teach that in elementary school when you're learning how to multiply? You're supposed to divide and check. Computers never check their work. That would be stupid. The answer has to come out the same way or else it's hardware's fault. So, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. But, um, of course, biology had a very long time to get to this point. But we have brains. I know. Mm -mm. So there's an open question that I need to do as well with our big brains. And, and then yes. the second question is, are you going to build a prototypical system, you know, an indefinitely scalable architecture, a toy system that to test these ideas and show that the performance is better the, the, or the robustness, and we have to be careful how we define performance. But yes, but once we define performance in a way that favors what we actually believe, which is uh, being either right or close, no matter what kind of horrible thing you do to the system. Absolutely. And I'm going to skip through a lot of the secondary arguments here because I want to do lots of demonstrations uh, uh, where we can see examples of this thing doing various stuff. It may. And in general, if, if we have enough money, mission critical, then we're going to have to come up with a correctness cost curve to say how much it matters to get the last bit right. And right now, we just say you have to get every bit right or else it's 100% wrong. And unfortunately, that's not tenable. And it gives no derivative. It doesn't tell you where to armor. When in fact, and I've got a grad student working on this, is that inside typical programs, you can take certain operations and armor just those certain operations. There's sort of moments of high flex in the transformation that's happening from input to output. And if you know, if you admitted that close was better than, perf was better than far, you could say, well, what I really ought to do is do this comparison 10 times, and then don't worry about all those other ones.
But if we say you must have down to the bit correctness or your crap, there's no derivative. You can't find anything there. Okay, so let me rush on a little bit so that we can so see. Is, go for it. Is, uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, an, an, an analogy would be in cultural. I mean, there is an argument, right, for cultural categories um, acting as error correcting devices on the mechanical generation of sound. So, for example, it's well known, right, if you look at the way in which words are articulated, um, the, we all have different voices. But we, that doesn't necessarily compromise our ability to interpret a word. And so there is an actually, there's an optimal packing of, of words using variation in sound, which would be an entity presumably. Um, uh, I see what you're saying. Right. Error correcting on an ambiguity that can't be eliminated in hardware, meaning the vocal cords. Right, right. You've got some range of things that you can yeah. do. You've got, uh, you'd like to have common utterances be short. Uh, and but how can you do that so they're still be clearly distinguishable? Well, you'd like to have a confusion matrix that told you more than yeah. did he say it exactly right, or this word is just different enough. Exactly. Yes. Uh, uh, for example, yes. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, um, uh, so centralized control, another one of the things that is what we do. Uh, the way we compute is we have the central process unit, the CPU, talking to the RAM, the random access memory, and it sends addresses and gets back instructions to execute and data to operate on. And I call out this one thing, the program counter. That's one tiny, tiny little register in a modern machine. It's 64 bits long because it's the size of an address. The program counter specifies the next instruction to be executed from anywhere in memory. And the real world of security is if you can divert the value in the program counter once under external control that wasn't expected by the programmer, to first order, you can always take over the machine. So talking about correctness and periods of high nonlinearity in the transfer function, the program counter is unbelievably nonlinear. And attacks on uh, security attacks inevitably end up at some point diverting the program counter to some place it wasn't expected to go to, and then bad things happen. And from the moment of that first diversion, everything else is just icing on the cake. It's finding the way to make that diversion. Now, seeing a block diagram like this gives you the impression, oh, this seems reasonable. We got these two things. They're talking. Uh, but this is not what it actually looks like in the real world. So I went digging for the statistics on this particular laptop, my actual laptop, to see what this look, should look like more to scale. And it looks like this, uh, um, in terms of the number of transistors assigned to the different functions inside the machine. Here's the CPU. Uh, it's got 625 million transistors, according to Intel. And this is 8 gigabytes of RAM, which is what this thing has got which has got some 68 billion uh, uh, gates in it. Now again, if you get into electronic engineering, the, these things, are, they're not really transistors. These aren't really transistors either. There's all kinds of fuzzy stuff. But you get the idea. The CPU is this unbelievable bottleneck. Every single thing in here cannot do anything to first order without going through there. The thing is incredibly hot. It's incredibly high leverage in terms of what you need to attack, the only thing you need to attack to make things go wrong. Well, if we're going to give up on centralized control, what are we going to do? Here's again our CPU and memory. It's being clocked at some clock speed. This was, say, you know, 1940. This is, say, you know, 2000. The entire history of scaling has been to make the path between the CPU and the memory wider, more bits going back and forth at a time, make the clock go up and down faster, and make the memory bigger. And that's how we've scaled the history of computing. And that's what's running out. We can't make these clocks go any faster uh, without having the thing melt down or keep it stored under liquid nitrogen. Uh, um, so instead, we've gone to this kind of thing with these multi-core to make you think you're getting something better, uh, um, when in fact the secret truth is like, you know, it looks like you've got three cores that you could run this super fast, 
But in fact, if you ran all three cores that fast, it would melt down. So the CPU secretly throttles it. You can really only run one or two of them for more than a little fraction of a second before it shuts down. What we need to transition to is not uh, starting from a single cell creature and then ending up with a really big single cell, which is what we have done so far. We have to make the transition to multicellularity, where we now let this thing actually get smaller, the CPU gets slower, the memory gets smaller, but now we scale by sticking zillions and zillions and zillions of them together. And this is the distributed control. We have to figure out a way to do this without saying, here is the privileged head node, and everything goes through here, and these are all slaves. And if we do that, then of course, we just have to attack the head node. And in fact, we still have centralized control. It's centralized in the head node. Okay, we have to get past that and figure out how to do decision making anyway. And this is an important point. So what role does consensus play in this? Yeah, exactly. So in order to do a non-trivial computation, at some point we're going to make a non-linear transformation. And in order to do that to first order, we're making a decision. We're choosing to go left or go right. And that needs to be a single decision so that our body doesn't tear itself in half in going partly left and partly right. So the fact that I'm saying we need decentralized control does not mean we are not making singular decisions. So consensus, some kind of collective action to say, well, I think we should go left uh, um, or whatever. But we no longer want it to be the case that the locus of that decision is always in this one little CPU thing. Now the locus of control might be, a, I think Luis is the guy to pick. What should we go for dinner? Uh, and we do that. And there's this big nonlinearity that occurs because he likes weird food, whatever it happens to be. Okay? So the point is, is we're taking what had been fixed in space by hardware, CPUs where all the decisions happen, and we're now lifting it up and making it a software problem that now we have to program consensus, voting, leader elections, quora uh, detection, stuff like that to make decisions. Programmable gate arrays, I mention, uh, uh, this, this here, is similar, right? Because we have lots of hardware that's all connected together. This could be a programmable gate array. But in fact, the way a programmable gate arrays are used now is what goes on, the contents of de what determines what happens in each of these things gets initialized at power on time. There's, you know, so the, the circuit wakes up, it says, oh, it's brand new, it's empty. Get the bit stream that determines what kind of hardware this is going to be. Download that once, and then you're done. This is a far more flexible thing. This little area could be acting like memory now, and a half a second from now, it'll win an election and suddenly start acting like processor. FPGAs, by and large, can't do that. In, in some weird cases, they have some hot reconfiguration, but it's very limited. And you find that the internet, which has routers and certain mm, structure, sure. The internet is about as close an example as most people are familiar with. Uh, um, the internet has fixed width addressing like that. So that means it's going to run out. And in fact, it kind of already has for the smaller IPv4 addresses like that. So it's not actually indefinitely scalable. If we added more and more and more and more internet, eventually we'd run out of internet. But the other case, well, it's literally true. Uh, uh, like that, there's merely 10 to the 38th addresses available even in the bigger, wider uh, internet that we're trying to transition to. That seems like a lot, but that's not the point. The point is we have to have a centralized naming service, we have to guarantee everything is, is unique, and so forth. All right, let me skip this one because we've taken a whole lot of time. Uh, um, I've mentioned indefinite scalability a couple of times. This is the idea that as part of the hardware-software renegotiation, 
it has two key elements. Number one is that hardware becomes best effort. Software also becomes best effort. Number two, hardware must be indefinitely scalable. However you design your hardware, it must be possible to add more and more and more and more of it and build an arbitrarily big computer if I have the real estate, the power, the cooling, and the money. I can build a computer from here to Jupiter if I can find the materials without ever running into the IPv4 address limit or the synchronous clocking limit or whatever. Okay. And by adopting this thing, which again is another hard choice, because if you look at how electrical circuits are designed, they are constantly exploiting the finiteness of the circuit. They're throwing errors out the edges. It works fast inside and communication off chip incredibly slow. All of this stuff. By adopting an indefinitely scalable approach, all of those cheats are forced to the front. The fact that it's so slow to move off the chip, that's going to be your bottleneck in an indefinitely scalable evaluation of hardware instead of the speed that happens inside. All right. We're totally out of time. Let's run on. Uh, um, so the final thing is this idea of synchronous clocking, that a, a computer has a single clock that everybody dances to. The drummer goes and everybody goes. And that makes things a lot simpler, avoids all kinds of trouble, and it's incredibly expensive. In modern VLSI designs, we are now paying 40% of the total power budget just to push the clock out to everybody on the chip. Almost half of the power, not doing any computing at all. It's just saying, here, 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 uh, uh, like that. You see, we're getting to the edge of what makes sense. The hard assumption that we make is we're going to ditch uh, synchronous clocking. We're going to build a, a grid that's going to have events happening all over the place, and those events are going to occur asynchronously. They're going to occur when they occur. And that's it. And again, it's the hard assumption to make. But in exchange, if you can actually write software that does something under non-determinism, indefinitely scalability, open-ended systems, and asynchronous event delivery, that software is going to be tough. Here's the machine that's going to do it. There's a, this is our 2008 round of hardware. It's actually a tiny little board. There's like eight of them there. Uh, that each of these, the things that's diagonal there, it's like a 2007 cell phone uh, uh, that we got on our own board and put it in so it could talk to its four neighbors simultaneously. And we'd like, we're hoping this year to maybe do another generation of hardware using lessons learned. But the idea is each of these tiles of hardware has a little patch of cellular automata grid on it. And if an event happens in the middle of it, then it does it. If an event happens on the edge, then when it happens, they'll communicate with each other to say what the changes were. So the tiles will try to hide the fact that the grid is partially sitting on corners and edges and so forth. But it only tries very hard because it doesn't have to. It doesn't guarantee every site will get the same number of events. It doesn't even guarantee that different sites will see the same rate of events. So let's, let's look at a couple of demos before we completely run out of time. Uh, um, all right, this is the simulator uh, for the movable feast machine that we were just looking at. These things here, this is simulating two tiles that are connected to each other. And we can put stuff in here. Uh, well, let me, let me do the little the demo that I do these days. So this is me. I drew a box, all right? Uh, and that's great. Um, it has an inside and outside. The box is made out of an element called uh, wall. There it is. Uh, uh, now, I could make a cooler thing uh, uh, here uh, um, by making a machine that builds a box. Uh, um, and it does a much better job than I do. do. It's cheaper, it's faster, and it's great. Uh, um, now, if I simulate the passage of time using my eraser tool, you know, these things all gradually get chewed up. And that's the nature of the business. The suggestion is, is that where we want to go, this is where living software comes in, is something like this. Whoops. Uh, uh, oh, let's get the pencil back. 
Uh, um, all right. Uh, uh, it's pink. It must be alive. Uh, um, and it's acting differently. Let's make the eraser bigger uh, uh, so we can see what's happening. So this is not just a piece of wood shaped like a box. This is a living thing that knows where it is in the box, and it knows what its neighbors should be. Whoops, I killed it. Uh, uh, like that. It took a pretty big gun, though. Uh, um, and I can knock more of these out, uh, and so forth. Okay? This, I suggest to you, uh, is an example of living software. It's not just a pattern of bits that were laid down once. It's a series of constraints, live constraints that are being checked and checked and rechecked all the time. Whenever one of those asynchronous events happens to land there, the thing will come and check. Is, is everything the way it looks like? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Whoops. What does uh, it, check against? it checks against its built in notion of, of what it's supposed to be. Let's take a look at one of these atoms. If we zoom in on this thing, uh, uh, all right, this is a box element. Whoops. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, um, it's a box element. Inside the box element, it's got a data member called a line. And inside the line, it's got a data member called a position, which is where it thinks it is on the line. If we pick adjacent guys, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and so on, like that. Each piece knows where it's supposed to be on the line. And uh, I just messed that up. And this is the code that actually implements the box that we just saw. Without going through the details of it at all, it's written in a language called Ulam, uh, which we have developed ourselves and built a compiler for. Uh, Elena has done the primary development on the compiler. It compiles into C++, which then compiles into code, which at the moment goes to the simulator, but could and hopefully soon will actually go to new tile hardware. And the idea is each element of the box has a little line thing that keeps track of where it's supposed to be. And the line, uh, it's too complicated to go through, I'm sorry. Uh, um, well, but the important point is this code right here. Uh, the line says, am I the minimum side of the line? No, I'm not the minimum. Is the guy next to me empty? Well, then go ahead and make a copy of myself with the position being one less than mine. On the other hand, if I'm not at the max and the spot in the greater direction is empty, make a copy one greater than me. So this is reproduction. This code is part of the DNA, so it's in every cell. That's right. And this is considered to be part of the physics of the world. We are gods when we're programming this thing. So the goal is to come up with a, a periodic table of these elements that allow us to do useful things that we can burn into tile after tile after tile and then let computations run on top of it. Correctable, these guys. Yes, and in fact, these guys work as hard as possible not to be adaptable. Uh, and it, that works great when we just hit it with something like uh, erasing stuff. Uh, uh, but if we were due to something nastier, like hit it with x-rays uh, that just flips random bits, now we start getting things going crazy like that. Because we're flipping bits inside that can make it think it's in the wrong position or it's turning in the wrong direction. And things can get worse and worse and worse. Uh, um, yes, <laughs> we worked on that. <laughs> if, if you look in the simulator, uh, um, as I come in here, get rid of this thing, uh, um, as I come in with the x-ray tool, you see those little yellow triangles in there. Uh, uh, those ye little yellow triangles uh, represent one of two things. Either we went to fetch the atom and try to find the code that went for that atom type, and there was no code for that atom type, in which case we just erase it. Or while we were executing the code, it failed. It violated some built-in assumption, in which case, once again, we just erase it. So the code might not work if we flip random bits in the thing. And it might cause a moral equivalent of a seg fault or whatever it is. But the simulator tries as hard as it can to catch that. And there's a predefined rule. You get erased. 
and it's up to your neighbors, the rest of the system that you're part of, to do something about that. There's determinism in the small. From the time that we call the behave function uh, um, here, the behave function is the one that's called automatically when it's time for this guy to have an event. And it's up to the hardware and the operating system to provide best effort determinism for the length of one event, and that's it. After that event is finished, there's no guarantee we're going to come back anytime soon and give you another one anything like that. Let me just put the very last one up because it's kind of cool and it's brand new and then we can stop because this is going really long. Uh, um, now where is this guy? Um, uh, here it is. Uh, uh. So one of the things that you need to do if you're actually going to build non-trivial stuff is be able to build large objects that do things. So here's an object that uh, grows and then moves. Uh, um, and the way it moves is by creating these swap lines that just the swap line refuses to get too far ahead of itself, but whenever it's nearly lined up, it just flips itself with whatever it is. And the net result is whatever it is moves one square in the other direction. The idea of how to come up with large object motion in cellular automata things goes back at least to von Neumann and Ulam in their original constructor uh, arguments uh, designs where they did it mostly with the, const the constructor arm copying the thing. And it's been worked on by several people since, including Michael Arbib, who did a sort of theoretical treatment of it. But to my knowledge, this is actually a little bit new. Uh, um, so not only do we have a thing moving, but we can actually like, oh, let's pause this a little bit, and we can put stuff inside this. Uh, uh, maybe a little bit of wall, what the heck. Uh, um, and that all gets moved as well because the swap line automatically spreads to keep track of the contours it's going over and swaps everything that's inside it like that. So this, this is brand new last week. Uh, uh, the next step... Say again? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, well, this guy's not so much fun because he's actually reached the edge of the universe and he's smart enough to stop. Uh, uh, but let's make another one. Uh, um, uh, all right, so the first thing is we'll do some not too nasty stuff, like we'll just, you know, blow holes in it. Uh, um, and because this wall constructed itself from a single seed, it actually knows how to restore itself pretty well. The swap lines, on the other hand, if we kill some of them, they don't know how to grow themselves necessarily. Uh -oh. Oh, 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 oh. And so sometimes you get some tearing. That's what we're seeing here. So this is basically, you know, a transporter accident, you know, evil Spock, uh, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, if we bring in the x-rays, it gets much worse because now we can start faking out guys that they're not where they thought they were and we can get things to be very, very bad. The, uh, the design of the swap line and the underlying, this is called a diamond wall, uh, um, actually has a bunch of robustness features that try to recover from this. But motion in the land of x-rays is a dangerous business. And we just have to realize we're going to get lots of good plot there. I've talked way too long. Thank you so much for listening. If there's any more questions, I'd be happy. Uh, uh.